My name is Hugh Taylor from the University of Brighton. Um, if I take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of London, <laughs> to quote the song, five, five minutes walk, we can do it during the, uh, the fire alarm perhaps, we get to Broad Street where John Snow, uh, 157 years ago, is it? Can't do my maths. Perhaps was the first person to demonstrate that cholera is waterborne. And uh, although he didn't use the acronym GIS, he was probably carried out the first uh, piece of GIS uh, there. So here we are 157 years later, and we're talking about cholera in Haiti. Haiti. And it's, uh, I think it's marvellous that an organisation like MSF is realising that uh, tackling this problem is not just the uh, role of physicians, but uh, involves GIS experts, microbiologists, epidemiologists. It's a multidisciplinary problem. So I have 10 minutes and I'll try to keep to time. So today I'm going to tell you about um, a treatment system that I was involved in in Haiti, working with my MSF colleagues. And um, normally we put the acknowledgements at the end, but at the risk of running out of time, it's important that I say that the real heroes of this work were um, uh, Jeff Fesselet, Adrian Mahama, Emanuele Sotsi, and the national team working on the site, who did an incredible amount of work over uh, many months. I just um, flew in, uh, spent two weeks there, and here I am getting the glory this afternoon. So it's those people you need to um, thank for if you think the work was impressive. So also, I can save a bit of time because uh, Ludovic did a very good job of explaining to you, showing you much better maps than I have, the situation in Haiti. So uh, I think you know that about the... Uh, uh, earthquake in 2010 and um, the cholera outbreak in October of that year. And um, in December, Jeff Fesselet started to think about this problem at a uh, cholera treatment centre in Port-au-Prince. And that's what we're focusing on today. So a few photographs that I took out there. I didn't have much time to travel around. I was very busy while I was there. The, the security with MSF was enormous. It was very difficult to get out and about. And also, clearly, there are... <laughs> some of you have encountered that, I assume. Um, also, there are, eth of course, ethical issues taking photographs in such a disaster situation. But this, this, these few photo photographs perhaps show my first impressions of Port-au-Prince. The fact that in the area some buildings would be remaining standing while others were totally collapsed, you know, sort of taught me something about structural engineering, perhaps. And um, everywhere you will see that uh, a, m a main issue was providing clean drinking water by tanker or by whatever method. Um, early on in the day, at the, near the cholera treatment centre, when I was sort of getting a bit of criticism from medics who were saying that I couldn't guarantee that I was sterilising the wastewater, I was thinking, let's put this in context a little bit. So I went out for a little wander to the local river, and I'll show you some data from this river that puts our un even untreated wastewater, let alone our treated wastewater, into some context. You'll also might be able to see in this photograph that the healthiest organisms in this disaster were the town pigs who are living under the bridge here and leaving, living off the garbage, which uh, you know, explains to you the, the public health situation in the city at that time. So, um, what can we say? The cholera treatment centre, Center Del Mar 33, it was being built um, over a period of time by uh, MSF as an excellent maternity hospital, but, hospital, but uh, given the circumstances, it was rapidly turned into a cholera treatment centre. Um, Jeff Fesselet and his colleagues were looking at how to deal with large amounts of wastewater full of Vibrio cholerae. If you think about the uh, faeces of a... Um, a cholera patient, you get about you can get about ten to the eight per hundred mil vibrio in the feces in your pack. It's actually changed. It says one hundred and eight, so that's ten to the eight, a lot, lot more. So an enormous number of vibrio. And um, of course, cholera treatment centres are doing fantastic work, but you're concentrating people. You could make the situation worse if you don't deal with the water and sanitation issue. So the normal thing to do would be to infiltrate it into the soil. But uh, when Jeff and his colleagues dug into the ground, this is what they found, very high water table, and traditional methods were just not going to work. So we had to, they had to think of something um, quick to solve this problem. So uh, Jeff talked to many people all around the world, eventually got in touch with me, because many years ago I did some work out in Brazil on lime treatment of wastewaters as a simple, cheap method to treat wastewater quickly and reduce pathogens. And it, that was a long time ago, almost 20 years ago. I thought that was gone and dusted and forgotten about. It's amazing how research sometimes comes back into circulation and finds its use. 
So jumping back, sorry, complications, the high water table. Um, lack of space, this was designed as a maternity hospital. 80% of the land was taken up by the buildings and infrastructure. So trying to build a treatment system on site for this waste was difficult, to say the least. Lack of time, this needed to be done quickly. Pregnant women were about to arrive any minute to find tanks and tanks of um, wastewater full of Vibrio cholerae. Not a very good situation. So we are in a hurry. So I am incredibly impressed by the t work that the MSF team, uh, the work that they did there. I, need, I haven't played a minor, minor part in this. But um, science in action, um, I'm cer certainly not a... As uh, Jimmy was saying, I hope not, I'm not a boffin in a laboratory. I was quite happy to get out there and cart some of this muck around and uh, take it to a highly equipped laboratory. <laughs> this is what we're dealing with. And if I forget later on, what I, one thing that comes out of this is advice I can give MSF perhaps in preparing better for future emergencies and, and keeping some kit on hand so you can do some good research in the field. It was very difficult doing research under these circumstances. So... Uh, Jeff and his colleagues thinking, what are the potential solutions to this problem? Well, there's off-site treatment and disposal. I'll come back to that. There's a, a landfill site, for want of a better word, at uh, Trutier, I can never pronounce it properly, near port au -Prince. I'll show you some photographs of that, and, whether, and you'll decide whether that's a good place to put wastewater full of Vibrio colliery. Um, next one, well, I'm a course leader for uh, MSC Water and Environmental Management, and I say developing countries, hot climates, always biological treatment by waste stabilisation ponds, but impossible in this situation. You're not going to build that at the maternity hospital. You're not going to even get, get it to work when you've got wastewaters with chlorine in it. It's just not a possibility. Disinfection, possibly you could put tons and tons of chlorine into this, but there's so much organic matter, we don't really know what happens to the Vibrio in chlorination and whether the Vibrio inside the fecal solids is actually, is the, whether the chlorine's penetrating into it. There are lots of problems with chlorine. It has its role, obviously, but it, it's limited in guaranteeing safe wastewater. So we come to our fourth solution, and it's the one that we went forward to, and realising I'm getting too excited about this and running out of time, so I'm moving on. Okay, this is the um, landfill site, and this is where many NGOs were disposing of their wastewater, not just MS, well, I'm not sure MSF's position on this, but I know of other NGOs that regrettably uh, were emptying pit latrines in this situation, where people were, frankly, living and working. So uh, not a good idea, I would have thought. So this was treatment system, very low tech, um, based on what I did in Brazil 20 years ago. It's based on drinking water treatment, and you just, this first version, you add lime. That's not lime, the fruit, that's uh, the lime from limestone, cal, the show, is it, in French? Um, and you're raising the pH, you're coagulating it, you're putting it into a sedimentation tank, you're leaving it overnight, the solids drop to the bottom, the pH is so high, the assumption is that you're not only removing the indicators, E. coli, but you're killing off the Vibrio colliery. You've got a much safer, a much clearer um, clarified effluent then to dispose of. Uh, a few photographs. It does produce a sludge that needs to be dried and we have to think about the implications of dealing with that safely. Uh, there's no point us from Europe going out to do research that furthers our careers and then damaging the health of national workers. So health and safety was a Im very important issue and I was very impressed by MSF's commitment to health and safety of the workers there. And here's Jeff checking the liner. We were concerned that the sedimentation tank was not de really designed for pHs of 11 and whether it was going to work or burst and spread the contents all over the hospital, which, again, not a good thing. It didn't, and it was fine, by the way. <laughs> so, the uh, method that I'm used to, you add lime, you raise the pH, you get this precipitation process, and I have to be quick, but it was, it was effective, 90% solids removal, we couldn't do regular Vibrio colliery testing, very, very difficult to do, but we count E. coli, and we assume, and I talk for hours about this, that the E. coli sort of correlates with the uh, Vibrio colliery. Not exactly, but good enough. And we produce an incredibly clean wastewater. By World Health Organization standards, you could use this for irrigation quite safely. And uh, I went, as I say, I wandered out to the river, and uh, that's what I found. If you, if you recognise plates, this is on chromocult, those blue colonies, those are E. coli from the river in one millilitre. Um, that's what we got in 10 millilitres after treatment. I know that's not very good science, showing you just two photographs. There is more data than that, but that's, if you want to take our message, that's not bad. Okay? <laughs> 
There's another method which my colleague Emanuele pushed for, and I think he's probably right that uh, um, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and this is a low pH method which we had a chance to develop as well. Uh, the idea is if you push the pH below 7 or above 7, you're going to kill off, it's going to disinfect and kill off this Vibrio. He thinks that this method uses less resources, so he's trying this, uh, he's working there again out in Haiti and tr developing this method. So, move, coming to the end, I hope. So what have we learned? I think you might agree with me that uh, disposal to uncontrolled municipal sites is just not on, really, and has to be dealt with in some way. Uh, didn't have had a chance to talk about this in detail, but the uh, feces in the buckets were hitting chlorine, and, uh, and it, it was hanging around in tanks for a long time before we even got to treatment. So our wastewater, even before treatment, was much cleaner than I'd expect from a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, biological treatment, not possible, I'd say, in this situation. And I, we can talk, I can talk again about chlorination, but I don't think it's universally applicable for wastewaters. So I have been spoilt. I've worked in a nice laboratory in the south coast of England uh, for many years. I'm used to lots and lots of equipment, lots of membranes, lots of s support staff. And I found it really frustrating that uh, we were doing really good work, but we weren't getting enough good quality data. I don't know how much of this is publishable, pu publishable going back to the earlier speaker. There's important stuff there, but whether a peer review journal will take it at this stage, I doubt it, which is a pity. But take home message, our simple on-site physical chemical methods appear to be effective. Further research required, of course, all researchers say that, because we want the funding. And if you've got a checkbook with you and you want to come up and organize that, please do come and see me. Research just provides more questions as ever. Just how effective are the treatments? We've got some data. I would love to do this properly, proper jar tests in the laboratory. My idea is to run a PhD over three years and this person would do proper controlled tests in the laboratory and then send this person off to somewhere where there's endemic Vibrio cholerae, maybe Bangladesh, and see if we can get the results to correlate. And then you can just have a simple system testing E. coli and you've got more trust in the fact that you are removing Vibrio cholerae uh, safely, because doing this work, it was pretty tough. We were sort of under attack, not in a very nasty way, but people were questioning what we were doing and whether we were putting lives at risk. Uh, so we had to keep thinking, is, is our data good enough? Is this safe? Uh, the ecology of Vibrio cholerae, it's, uh, some is known, others not. A lot of tests in the past have been done on non-toxigenic strains. In order to do the work safely in the lab, you use a non-toxigenic strain. Now we believe that the toxigenic strains might behave completely differently to the non-toxigenic strains, so more complications. Um, this is always an issue. Um, I talked to Bill from Oxfam and they said, well, they're not really into these big, large-scale wastewater treatment plants. They're, perhaps we can use lime in pit latrines. It has a role there. But if we are going to uh, build uh, systems, we need staff to be... Uh, uh, trained very quickly. As I was sat here, I was just thinking, if, you, if MSF wants to send its Watts, young Watson engineers to Brighton for training in this, I'm quite happy to arrange that. Um, we need proper equipment. MSF could auto invest in, I was talking to your medical director earlier, I think you ought to invest in some good kit, keep it in Amsterdam or wherever, and get it out quickly and start getting some data to make the most of these situations. These are appalling conditions. You can get more data and we can use it and it can improve what you do in the future. Uh, and uh, measuring the actual pathogen itself on site, difficult but possible, I think. Right, after I finished the work, after I came back, you'll be aware of a UN report with uh, several uh, recommendations, including this one. In order to prevent the introduction of contamination into the local environment, UN installations worldwide should treat fecal wastewater using on-site systems that inactivate pathogens before disposal, which was very nice to hear, since I'm looking for funding, but there you go. <laughs> I'm not that cynical, but there you go. Am I on time? No, not really, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, I would, as I say, I went back to Brighton singing the praise of MSF. I was very, very impressed. It was an amazing experience for me. I learned a lot. I'd like to thank the people I named before, but particularly the guys on site who we made them do very difficult things in very hot conditions and uh, it was amazing the support I got there. If you want to get in touch with me, my email address is there. Thank you very much. <laughs>